Harvey Rosenthal is the executive director of the New York Association of Rehabilitation Services. He's also a former classmate of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, and he's been kind enough to join us tonight from Florida, where he is away on vacation. Harvey, thanks so much for your time. You're very welcome, Liz. Um, and missing the snow, I should add, so it's good. <laughs> it's very good, but I think you're this on your is the way only home. <laughs> this is the only state in the union without snow, so <laughs> I picked the right one. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about this situation is, is an unusual one for you because, as I mentioned, you, you know Gabby Giffords. You actually went to school with her at the Harvard Kennedy School for Policy Leadership in 2003. But you're also Absolutely. an advocate for the mentally ill, and, and we believe that the shooter who, um, who grievously injured the congresswoman is probably ill. So you're sort of uh, caught in between these, these two individuals. Well, you're right. I grieve on both fronts. I uh, went to college at, uh, took a three-week class at Harvard Kennedy School on policy leadership, and Gabby was in the class, and we spent a lot of time together. And I found her then, and I'm sure now, to be just an, just an uh, extraordinary person, very dedicated, very bright, very talented and ambitious, uh, and she's done really well. Um, and it, one of the things that we're proud about of Gabby is that she credits her work on mental health parity as her proudest moment when she was in the Arizona legislature. And even in Congress, she's worked very hard for our community, really fighting against uh, discrimination and pushing for, for veterans' mental health services and access to recovery. So we grieve. Uh, she's a wonderful lady, and we, and we are praying for her, you know. What, when uh, you say, as a mental health... When you say mental health parity, though, just explain, if you would, for our viewers what that means. That is the laws that are that happen in New York. In New York, we had a law called the Timothy's Law, right. and now we have a national law that's part of health care reform, too, that basically eradicates the discrimination that prohibits access to mental health care in the same level as medical care. So it equalizes the care and ends that kind of discrimination, something we need very much now more than ever, equal access to mental health care. So you, you are concerned, and I think a lot of people in the mental health community are concerned, at, that so many times when we have incidents when someone who appears to be mentally ill does something heinous like this shooting, the reaction is immediately to jump to some kind of policy position that perhaps in the long run is not positive for people who suffer from mental illness. Well, completely. And I just want to start by saying, these, uh, when, when someone like this, this fellow is on trial, too often the, the people with, uh, with, with mental illnesses are on trial. And very often the public forgets the fact that we're not only uh, not more violent than the general public, we're 11 times more apt to be, uh, you know, but victims of violence. Um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, policies uh, like in Kendra's Law here in New York where we had a terrible tragedy that involved a person with a psychiatric disability. Right. And next thing you know, we have a policy that forces mental health care onto people and misses the point that uh, he was actually looking for care. This is very often a problem of the access to care, understanding of care, public understanding of, of the issue, early, early interventions. Uh, the, these ought to be the discussions, not forced treatment and things like that. But Harvey, isn't the problem here, and the problem in so many cases, particularly in the Kendra situation, that the individual who is the shooter is not a sympathetic figure? I mean, it's difficult to say to Americans, please keep this in mind, when the person that they're seeing, that the face of this violence, of this incident, is so clearly not somebody that you feel for when you do feel for of course for a grieving family for six people who are killed for a congresswoman who is struggling for her life no question no question but first i want to challenge the media who always finds the worst pictures and the most frightening pictures of 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 the of of, of these folks the, the other thing i want to say is that we have to recognize that one of the reasons we have so much stigma and discrimination is that one in five Americans have a mental illness and all of us have the symptoms at one time or another. So we're extra stigmatizing and fearful about, about this topic and these folks. I have a mental illness, most of my staff have a mental illness, uh, and, and millions of Americans have a mental illness and we can't be put on trial every time there's an act of violence, uh, however rare it is, involving, involving uh, a, a person with a mental illness. When you have you been following, I'm sure you've been following in much detail some of the parts of this story that perhaps other people are not. I mean, do you believe that if Jared Loeffner had been diagnosed, uh, had been receiving treatment, that perhaps this incident could have been avoided? Well, I've read a lot in the last few days. I've read a lot about the police reports and the school reports. 
And it does seem like, once again, he was showing evidence in the last few years. Again, I, I'm not an expert in this case by any means, but he seems to be have showing uh, all kinds of evidence of withdrawal, preoccupation, uh, anger, uh, and, uh, and uh, social adjustment problems. Mm -hmm. And what's, I think what, what most of us are wondering about is, is this really one of the issues about the, the crisis we have in the country on campus mental health? We really don't have good, good uh, uh, access uh, on the campus to mental health services of the kind that really works. And too often what happened here apparently is that he was seen as a disruption. People wanted to exclude him. They finally did, did exclude him and expel him and say he had to come back with a letter from a psychiatrist. That's not reaching out. That's not access to good care. That's not the kind of support that we're capable of doing uh, and, and that he might have needed. Harvey, but to play, to play devil's advocate, though, and, and I, I should disclose, I understand also, I mean, uh, there are a number of people in my life who are mentally ill, so I think I have some knowledge, although obviously not expertise in this particular issue. But when, to say to people, forced treatment is not something that's a good idea, that people who are mentally ill have rights, that forced treatment is, is, it can be harmful, isn't that a hard sell for most Americans, particularly at a time when they see someone who obviously is disturbed and wasn't receiving treatment do something of this kind of caliber? I think it's sad, but it is a hard sell, but I, but I think it's a sad uh, state of affairs. I think that once again that there's almost every time you look into a situation like this, you see a failure in our systems about not being available, not reaching out, uh, whether it's Andrew Goldstein or the murders in New York City some years ago. You know, let's talk about the murders in New York City that happened a couple years ago. There were four of them. One caused by a person with a mental illness. Two were, were police shootings of people with mental illnesses. And what the state and the city did was find out that in every case the people were failed by the, 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 the system of care. And what they did, instead of ordering more forced treatment in New York City, was to set up a care monitoring teams that would look at the care and get the providers and the system to be more responsive earlier on. Let's not blame people for failure of systems and let's not force people back into the same bad care that they either rejected or that failed them the first time. Well in New York actually we're about to come up to a point where it's quite clear that Medicaid which is the largest portion of the budget is going to receive some significant cuts and it's frequent that actually mental health treatment is the area that is often targeted because it's not deemed if you will from a holistic point of view it's not deemed crucial in terms of health care from the, from the body, right? It's, de it's not deemed something that is somehow interconnected with physical health. And so are you concerned that this is going to be an area targeted for cuts, A? Mm -hmm. And B, will you be able perhaps to use this particular incident as an argument that actually health care cuts would be detrimental, perhaps even to the safety of, of New Yorkers? I think it's an excellent point you're making. And let me start by saying the health department has got people with mental, health, mental illnesses in their sight in a very positive way, I think, because of the following. Medicaid is a, is a $50 billion program in New York, and what they've learned is the, while the average Medicaid recipient uses about $2,500 Medicaid a year, there's a cohort of people, 20% of the Medicaid group, about a million people, who use $30,000 a year in Medicaid, and half of, those, of that million are people with mental illnesses and medical conditions and substance abuse problems. Everyone is concerned about how to provide better out outreach, better access, better outcomes, and that keep people un out of avoidable hospitals and emergency rooms and contacts with law enforcement and homeless shelters and the police. So I think actually the, bud the budget pressure will actually cause uh, the government to want to do a better job, if only for cost reasons. Uh, and so there's, we, we've been doing some work, for example, in New York, Liz, uh, in something called a chronic, chronic illness demonstration program, not a great name, but we're in teams of people in the, on the streets of Queens, for example, with nurses and care coordinators finding people that are at risk, hard to engage, uh, high cost, high needs are the terms we use, and we're, we're using modern services. This is what I'm arguing for. We have the technology now to go to people before there are problems and serve them. We just have to move money from hospitals and emergency rooms and, and uh, state hospitals, if you will, and move it into the community where the people are and where we're not serving them, and set up the systems and fund them properly. You can, use it, you can do that with the money you have now if you redirect it, and you might even be able to produce some savings as well. I just want to ask you also, Harvey, before I let you go, because I know that you have a plane to catch back to New York. 
uh, and the weather's great here, so you're going to be okay. But I, I, I do want to ask you, were you comforted last night by the president's comments? Because he avoided, I thought, st any stigmatizing language. He did say that even the, the uh, invective, kind of the divisive language in, in America in political discussions needs to be taken down, but isn't specifically responsible for one individual's actions. Were you comforted that he didn't use broad brush strokes to, or this platform to call for some kind of policy change? I thought he, uh, President Obama was at his best last night. He was a real statesman, very soothing. He r spoke to our highest instinct. And he talked very briefly about the need for mental health service reform, but he didn't stigmatize anyone and engage in the rhetoric. So, yeah, I thought he did great last night. Yeah, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us to speak about this issue exactly. because obviously it's not on the forefront of the discussion. And um, uh, travel safe. Thanks for having me. Bye bye, Liz. Bye.